Welcome to Lecture 6 on the topic of transpiration. This lecture is part of the subject Plant Physiology, which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. This degree is offered jointly at both Melbourne Polytechnic and La Trobe University. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In order for you to understand the concepts presented here in Lecture 6, it is important for you to complete the lectures prior to this. Lecture 1 was an introduction to physiology. Lecture 2 introduced you to how water enters the roots and basic root structure. Lecture 3 explained about nutrient assimilation. And Lecture 4 we looked at the xylem in detail and how solutes are able to travel up this important organ. In Lecture 5 we were introduced to the leaf structure. And in this lecture, we learnt about the important functions of stomata. Please ensure that you have completed all associated Moodle quizzes and the DIY practicals before commencing with this lecture. In this lecture today, we are going to define transpiration and learn about what it is. We are going to learn about the mechanisms that underpin transpiration. We will concentrate on these two topics. We will also touch on what the transpirational compromise is and how it impacts on plants, as well as evaporative transpiration and the role that transpiration plays in global climates. The image on the slide shows a visual representation of transpiration. Transpiration can be defined as the process where the plant absorbs water through the roots and then gives off water vapour through the pores in their leaves. We've spent some time learning about how water is absorbed through the roots and how water moves through the xylem vessels into the leaves. We've also learnt about the structure of the stomata which appear on the surface of leaves. An important component of transpiration is that stomata have to be open in order for transpiration to occur. This is a visual representation of the major processes that a plant undergoes. You can follow the route of the water through the tree. You can see that transpiration re represents step 3 in this process. In order for transpiration to occur in plants, a difference in water potential is required. That is, the value in the soil needs to be more negative than the value in the air. For optimal growth to occur in a plant, the water in must equal the water out and therefore transpiration is exceptionally important in optimal growth. Transpiration rates can be controlled by stomata conductance, that is how opened or closed the stomata are at any one given time. The journey that transpiration undergoes is that a solute will start in the soil, move through the plant and then leave to the outer atmosphere. In this journey there are many different mediums the solute will incur. Different mechanisms of transport will involve different mediums. What do we mean by this? Well, an example of a medium is a cell wall, a cytoplasm, a lipid biomet layer, the internal xylem structures, for example. A mechanism is such as diffusion. In transpiration, there are two principal mechanisms that enables long distance transport of water and solutes to occur through the plant. The first is diffusion. This is determined by di uh, distance however. Diffusion at small distances is very efficient while diffusion at longer distances is less efficient. And this is where bulk flow is incorporated as this is much more effective at long distance transport mechanism. Osmosis is the third mechanism involved, and this involves both bulk flow and diffusion. So let's define these. 
Diffusion is defined as the movement of water from regions of high water concentration to regions of low water concentration. For more details you can refer to Lecture 2 where this concept was first introduced. Bulk flow is defined by the movement of water in response to pressure differences. It is dependent on the path of geometry. And the third mechanism, osmosis. This is defined as the process by which water moves across a membrane and involves both diffusion and bulk flow. The rate of transport of a solute depends on the magnitude of the driving force and the hydraulic conductivity conductance simply depends on the diffusion coefficient. These parameters can be estimated using water potential measurements. So let us review the influences on transpiration rates. Stomata are required to be open for transpiration rates to operate, but the relationship is more sophisticated than just them open. The greater the aperture of the stomata open, the higher the transpiration rates. Plants have very good control over their transpiration rates by changing the aperture of their stomata. The leaf boundary layer is a layer that exists immediately under the leaf. It is about one millimetre in diameter. The environment of this boundary layer can directly influence transpirational rates. The total leaf area of a plant or tree can influence how much water can be transpired through its canopy. Perhaps the biggest influences on transpiration rate are the climatic factors. They play an essential role in the operation of transpiration. Water is not pumped through a plant, but you can think of it more as it being pulled through the plant. And it is the changes in the climatic conditions which can influence how quickly or how slowly that water is pulled if the stomata are all open at the same aperture. Sunlight is required as stomata need to be open. This is true in most plants. Temperature is very influential on transpirational rates. As a rule of thumb, the higher the temperature, the faster and the greater the transpiration rates and the, more amount, the higher the amount of water lost. Wind can also influence the transpirational rates. As the water is coming through as a vapour, the greater the wind velocity, the quicker that water is being moved. Humidity is the third major climatic influence. The more water in the atmosphere, or the higher the humidity, the lower the transpiration tends to, rates tend to be relatively. On very dry, humid, uh, uh, non-humid days, the transpiration rates tend to be very fast. It, the elevation of a plant can also influence its transpiration rates. A formula has been devised which determines the quantification of these parameters with each other. That is, the impact of temperature, wind and humidity. And this is called evaporative transpiration. If you have the temperature on any one given day, the wind speed set at any one given wind speed, and the humidity at any one speed, uh, percent, you can calculate how all of these impact on the transpirational rates. This is a useful tool and can be used to determine irrigation strategies. An important measurement of the impact of climate is expressed through the vapour pressure deficit or VPD. <coughs> vapour pressure deficit is the difference, known as the deficit, between the amount of moisture in the air and how much moisture the air can hold when it is saturated. When relative humidity is high, vapour pressure deficit is low. 
The higher the VPD value, the greater the potential the air has for sucking moisture out of a plant. Further details on VPD can be found at the following link. Experimental evidence supports the link between VPD and transpiration rates. Stomata are responsive to atmospheric vapour pressure deficit so that potentially faster transpiration rates at low atmospheric humidity is constrained by the partial closure of the stomata, that is, a decrease in stomata conductance. Patterns of response differ between two species. Common forms of stomatal con conductance respond to vapour pressure deficit are shown here for the leaves with initially high rates of gas photosynthesis. Please read Plants in Action on the link below. This explains in more detail the response between stomatal conductance and VPD. Please insert your notes from this reading in, he in the lecture notes here. Optimal plant growth requires cells to be turgid. What we mean by turgidity is how much water that they contain. For example, if the same fluid flaccid cell is placed in a solution with a low solute concentration, it is, called, it is said to be hypotonic. The cell will gain water and then it will become turgid. Healthy plants are turgid most of the time, and certainly for optimal growth, turgid cells is something that you should aim for. The illustration on the slide shows this concept. A flaccid cell is placed in water. Water enters via osmosis through the cell membrane. The cell becomes turgid. So if you receive a hot, low humidity and high windfall day, you are likely to have your plants transpiring at a high rate. This can result in cells losing turgidity due to excessive amounts of water moving through the plant. This of course only can occur if there is enough available water around the root system. I'd like to introduce you the phenomenon known as guttation. It occurs when more water is forced out of the leaf than is being transpired. The droplets on the leaf have been forced out through root pressure changes. This is often seen in herbaceous dicots first thing in the morning. We know that transpiration plays an important role in plant water balance. But taking this one step further, what happens when the water availability in the plant root medium reduces? The plant is said in this situation to be under deficit. And under situations of deficit, transpiration or the rate of water loss becomes even more critical. The image on the slide from the FAO summarises the major inputs into water balance. Transpiration is an important component of this and is symbolised by the plant in the middle. The seed to the plant demonstrates growth. The impacts for water loss include radiation, low soil water availability, and of course the very important climate data. Transpiration plays an important role in soil water balance. We know that soil can be lost through evaporation, that is the heat from the sun causes soil to evaporate. We know that rain can fall from the sky to fill the soil, soil water up again once it's been used. And now we understand the process of how water is lost through a plant via transpiration. The image on the slide from the FAO summarises the concepts discussed here. In this lecture, we have learnt about the importance of transpiration in plant water balance. We have also learnt about the importance that transpiration plays in the role of water soil balance. So it is no surprise that transpiration also plays a critical role 
in hydraulic cycles. The image on the slide from the University Cooperation for the Atmosphere demonstrates the most significant inputs in the hydraulic cycle components, of which transpiration is considered an important component or loss of water from the soil through to the atmosphere. These have global implications. So now we have learnt about the importance of transpiration rates, how are they measured? Well, typically transpiration rates are determined as a measurement of water vapour concentration that passes out of a plant over a specific area over a unit of time. Hence, transpiration units are millimoles per metre squared per second. The higher the rate, the more water is that is being lost to the atmosphere. An infrared gas analyzer is a tool used by scientists to measure transpiration rates. An example of a commercial infrared gas analyzer to measure transpiration rates is called a LICOR. In this case, the LICOR has an attachment that clips onto an individual leaf, and a measurement of transpiration rate can be measured can be taken. Usually transpiration rates are taken when transpiration is at an optimal, that is just after midday on a full clear sky. There are other methods for measuring transpiration rate, such as containing the plant in a chamber. This however comes with difficulties both from a technical aspect of keeping the chamber completely sealed and from an interpretation aspect in that you will be changing the light quality and humidity within this chamber. Transpiration rates have been estimated via satellites by imagery. Another expression of transpiration can be shown by evaporative demand. Evaporative demand is defined as the amount of water transpired in order to realise a growth rate where light is not limited. There is a close relationship between transpiration and dry matter plant growth. The observations on the slide demonstrate the relationship between transpiration and plant temperature. As plant temperature increases, initially transpiration will increase until an optimal level of transpiration occurs. This will vary in different species, but in millet this occurred just over 35 degrees C. As the temperature continues to rise, transpirational rates will fall, as tomato do react to the changes in VPD and temperature. Please watch the following video, Transpiration. This will give you an overview of transpiration and the concepts presented here accompanied with some visual representation of the action of transpiration. The second video I'd like you to watch is on plant nutrition and transport by Mr. Anderson. This links both plant nutrition and plant transport, bringing this topic to an end nicely. Please insert notes from this lecture here. There are two sections in the recommended textbook Taze and Zyger I'd like you to read. The first is on chapter 4, water movement from the leaf to the atmosphere, and the second is chapter 6. This is on the topic of solute transport. Please ensure you read the whole of this chapter 6 and add your notes in this section here. And now to bring this lecture to a close. In this lecture on transpiration, you should now be aware of the important function and the role of transpiration in plants, in the soil, water, environment and in the hydro hydraulic systems. You should understand the mechanism, that is, how is trans water pulled through plants? What is the role of stomata? How does climate influence transpiration rates? And what are the physical properties, such as diffusion and osmosis, that aid the process of transpiration? And finally, you should be able to relate the importance of this physiological process to agriculture. This brings us to the end of Lecture 6.